I'm going to be sharing a dream that I had uh, back in January 29th of 2022. Um, as with any dream or any word that anyone gives you, always take it to the Lord and always test the spirit behind it. I was running into a mall because very large military planes were flying over cities and spraying a mist or fog that represents great deception that would kill people caught in it. This is a spiritual death. So wherever you happened to be when it was being sprayed, you were stuck there. Once inside, there were lots of displaced people already hunkering down. Many were sleeping. They were sleeping there because they had nowhere else to go. I was trying to get them to understand and tell them about things concerning the end times and about the true agendas happening surrounding false narratives. The mall is the church. The church. Those who recognize the outside danger sought to escape the deception. The safety is not in a physical building, but being connected to Jesus and the body of Christ. Many in the church are clinging to the narratives of the world instead of renewing their minds and severing ties with all narratives that contradict the word of God. They are currently being pulled into allegiance with another spirit, whether they know it or not. It is seducing them to yoke themselves with unbelievers based on emotion, politics, racial grievance, sexual identity, and many other carnal causes. There will be a high price to pay. It's an article I found later after the fact, um, while expounding on this dream. U.S. Special Operations Command, responsible for some of the country's most secretive military endeavors, is gearing up to conduct internet propaganda and deception campaigns online using deep fake videos according to federal contracting documents reviewed by the intercept the plans which also describe hacking internet connected devices to eavesdrop in order to assess foreign population susceptibility to propaganda come at a time of intense global debate over technologically sophisticated disinformation campaigns their effectiveness and the ethics of their use romans 1311 Wake from sleep, cast off the works of darkness, and put on the armor of light. Behold, I am going to come like a thief, blessed, happy to be envied, is he who stays awake or alert, and who guards his clothes, so that he may not be naked, have the shame of being seen or exposed. Revelation 16.15 Some wanted to hear and know what was actually coming. Many were listening, but there were one or two who wanted to shout me down to keep the others from hearing and being saved. I ended up leaving that place. God did not tell me to leave. I allowed the ones trying to shut me down to drive me away from the place God put me. I stepped out of his will because of people and searched for somewhere else to go. Note, this is why the Lord has been repeatedly saying to slow down get quiet, be still, so I don't get anxious or restless and begin to wander and lose my alertness and no longer have my clothes. Clothes represent righteousness. In my wandering around the mall, I ended up naked, but I was not ashamed, as there were many others who were naked and many who were clothed. Those who were naked were united and joined together, but their unity was not in God or his will. Many who attend the church gatherings are not actually walking with Jesus. Isaiah 47, 3, your nakedness will be uncovered. Your shame will also be exposed. I will take vengeance and will spare no man. Nudity now has implications of sinfulness attached to it. With few exceptions, the Bible presents nakedness as shameful and degrading. Genesis 9, 21, Exodus 20, 26, Exodus 32, 25. 2 Chronicles 28, 19, Isaiah 47, 3, Ezekiel 16, 35, 36, Luke 8, 27, Revelation 3, 17, Revelation 16, 15, Revelation 17, 16. The only passages in which nudity is free of shame are those that describe Eden's idyllic setting or that deal with the marital relations. Proverbs 5, 18 through 19, Song of Solomon 4. We still live in a fallen world, surrounded by lust, immorality, and perversion. 
The innocence of Eden is gone. Nature's philosophy ignores the results of the fall. Even in asexual context, public displays of nudity dishonor God by pretending an innocence that no longer exists. A Christian should definitely not be a nudist or participate in nudist activities. Back to wandering the mall. I encountered others, but did not interact with them. As I roamed, one woman was with her husband and pointed out that I was naked and made an effort to associate all of us who were naked as being united in common cause. In the context of this dream, she would have been trying to get me to see that I was connected to people who were no longer in right standing with the Lord, possibly a form of rebellion, but I did not receive the correction. You must submit to and endure correction for discipline. God is dealing with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not thus train and correct and discipline? Now, if you are exempt from correction and left without discipline, in which all of God's children share, then you are illegitimate offspring and not true sons at all. Proverbs 3.11, Proverbs 3.12, Hebrews 12.7-8. Proverbs 27, 6, faithful are the wounds of a friend who corrects out of love and concern, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful because they serve his hidden agenda. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, let no man deceive you by any means for that day, the day of the Lord shall not come except there come a falling away first, apostasy or rebellion, and that man of sin, the man of lawlessness and rebellion be revealed, the son of perdition. We wander from the truth when we forget that Jesus embodies truth, John 14, 6. Often unintentionally, we turn to the lies of the enemy, the one in whom there is no truth, John 8, 44. The ultimate cause for wandering from the truth is drinking from the wrong well. Proverbs 21, 16. A man who wanders from the way of understanding will rest in the assembly of the dead, that spiritual death from the deception. How to restore a wandering believer, even when it's you. My dear brothers and sisters, if someone among you wanders away from the truth and is brought back, you can be sure that whoever brings the sinner back from wandering will save that person from death and bring about the forgiveness of many sins. James 5, 19 through 20. The head and many membered body. The church is a vibrant organism, not merely an organization. It draws its vitality and direction from Christ, the head. And each believer has a unique and necessary place in its growth. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 13, 27. For just as the body is one and yet has many parts and all the parts, though many, form only one body. So it is with Christ. For by one Holy Spirit, we were all baptized into one body, spiritually transformed, united together. Whether Jews or Greeks, which are Gentiles, slaves are free, and we were all made to drink of one Holy Spirit, since the same Holy Spirit fills each life. Now you collectively are Christ's body, and individually you are members of it, each with his own special purpose and function. I want to reiterate this, each with his own special purpose and function. Ephesians 4.4, 4, there is one body of believers and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when called to salvation. It is vital that we know and believe the identity and purpose that God has given us through Jesus. It will keep us from wandering aimlessly within the church, from getting restless and disillusioned, and from allowing ourselves to open a door for the enemy to whisper into our minds and draw us away from the truth. We must close every door that gives Satan access. Our allegiance must be to the word of God at the cost of everything else, including what the world says your identity should be, because our real identity is found only in Jesus. We must be very careful what we allow our spirit, what we allow into our spirit and whom we allow to speak into our lives. As believers, we cannot listen to the narratives of the world at all. And even with Christi within Christianity, we must be filled with the word in his spirit, so we can discern almost right from what is actually right. First Peter 5.5, 5, in the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility 
toward one another because God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Revelation 3.17, the Laodicean may not necessarily say these things consciously, but he broadcasts it for all to see by his works and his way of life. He thinks he lives in his golden years, being blind to his own spiritual poverty. However, in the real tragedy of the situation, he thinks he's in good standing with God. Christ judges differently. Very concerned, the Laodicean cannot see his spiritual condition. He is spiritually bereft. Christ describes the Laodicean as poor. Biblically poor does not mean the same as our normal English usage of the word. It indicates someone who is weak, with no consideration of how wealthy he may be. To God, the Laodicean is spiritually weak when he thinks he is strong. Next, he is blind. Of course, this is not physical blindness, but a lack of spiritual comprehension or judgment. Just as a blind person cannot use his eyes to judge a circumstance, the Laodicean is unaware unknowing, unobservant, uncomprehending, and heedless. Christ also judges him as naked. Clothing or its lack illustrates a person's state of righteousness, and here it shows converted people who are still carnal. As Paul called the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 3.3, 3, the Laodicean is dominated by his fleshly attitudes. Physically oriented, he is governed by human nature rather than by God. Wretched and miserable together provide Further descriptions of poor, blind, and naked. Because they are poor, blind, and naked, they are wretched and miserable, even though they have not realized it. Miserable has been translated elsewhere as pitiful or pitiable. Wretched is especially interesting. In other places in the New Testament, it indicates destitution because of war. God means that while they may be wealthy, they are losing the spiritual war against Satan and their carnal nature. Revelation 3, 17, 19. The Laodicean's problem is that he does not even grasp that he is one, nor does he seriously consider the possibility. He really believes he is a Philadelphian. He is blind to his nakedness and instructed to salve his eyes so he might see. This reality should cause anyone who considers himself a Philadelphian to take a long, hard look at himself in the light of scripture. Could we be deceiving ourselves about our true state? Jesus Christ says so. It is somewhat paradoxical, but in this day of scattering and chastening, if we think we are Philadelphia, we are probably Laodicean. If we think we are Laodicean, we may be waking up and beginning to see our faults. If we do something about them, as we, we will be donning garments of true righteousness. Revelation 3.18 Gold, clothing, and eye salve represent the three major industries of Laodicea, banking, textiles, and medicines. Gold, spiritual riches, 1 Peter 1, 7, contrasts with the word poor, and fire symbolizes trial. God advises them to obtain spiritual riches produced through trials, which the self-sufficient Laodicean avoids by compromising. White garments contrast with their nakedness. Clothing helps us to distinguish people in groups. Because of the differences between men and women's clothing, sexual distinctions can be made. Clothes reveal status. A man in a well-tailored suit falls into a different category than a beggar in rags. Clothing provides a measure of comfort and protection from the elements. It hides shame and deformity. Biblically, God uses it to symbolize righteousness. Revelation 19.8 He instructs the Laodicean to dress himself in the holiness of God to cover his spiritual nakedness or self-righteousness. Their need of eye salve contrasts with their blindness. Commentators understand it to represent God's spirit coupled with obedience. The combination of the two gives a Christian the ability to see, to understand spiritual things. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of man, except the spirit of man which is in him. Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. 1 Corinthians 2, 10 through 11. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. Psalms 111.10 God intended the uncovering of nakedness to be done only within his prescribed boundaries of marriage. 1 Corinthians 7.2-5 
Christians can help reclaim the sanctity of marital relations and modesty by refusing to deaden our consciences through sexually graphic TV programs, movies, and magazines. We can guard our eyes against pornographic images by installing filters on our internet devices, and we can honor our bodies by refusing to uncover our own nakedness in the way we dress, talk, or behave. 1 Corinthians 6.18 Nakedness is no longer innocent, as it was in the Garden of Eden. The wise people do not uncover it in dishonoring ways. I later found myself going in a back hallway or corridor in the mall that led down to a hookup spot for men. There is perversion that has entered the church. On the way, I encountered a man who shined a light in my face and said he recognized me as one from another hookup spot. I was called out or exposed, but it was an effort to deter me from returning to what would destroy me. In that moment, I no longer wanted to return what I had return to what I had done previously by partaking in the LGBTQ lifestyle. I knew returning to that was not the answer, but I still allowed shame or offense to drive me to run back to where God delivered me from. As I made the decision to reject going back to my old overtly sinful LGBTQ lifestyle, instead of returning back to the safety of God's will, and allowing God to deal with me and the people who shouted me down and heal and restore me, I walked out the exit. I left the safety of the church altogether, went back outside where previously we were seeking to escape the deception. People were now embracing it and was again clothed, but this time it was in my own righteousness. Righteousness is more rightness and acceptability, especially before God. It points to a person's holiness and purity in heart and action. Self-righteousness, then, is a righteousness that comes from someone's own goodness and work. As Christians, we completely rely on Jesus' righteousness, not our own. Like all the other people who were united in common cause, but the common cause was not Jesus. They were moral, but were not walking in the truth of his word because they were not born again or even repentant. There was chaos and tragedy all around once outside, but I wasn't afraid or panicked. I was unrepentant and believing I was okay, but I was now walking in my own strength, thinking I was prepared to handle what I was about to face. Like all those taking the patriot oaths of allegiance and rising up in global rebellion, they are not walking with Jesus, but in a form of godliness, denying the power to come out of sin. Many are seeing themselves as righteous because they are comparing themselves to the once hidden, overtly wicked evils now being exposed. It allows them to rank their sin so low that it barely registers on their meter. Jesus pronounces a blessing for those who, during mankind's darkest moment, watch. That is, they are living prudently and properly. The natural byproduct of this close relationship with God is being alert to religious deception those who frame their life around the kingdom, the coming kingdom of God, will watch and keep themselves from the wiles of the devil. This is the end result of fulfilling the role of a watchman within the body of Christ, to be found standing in the faith, blessed of God at the dawn of his kingdom on this earth. Our world is moving toward this time of global cataclysm. Revelation 16 describes a future moment when people will be caught up in events engineered through the beast and false prophet. The former is a political leader of compelling personality and ability, and the other a religious leader unlike any in modern times. Together, they will convince armies to move toward Jerusalem to fight Jesus Christ at his coming. Warning and Hope This is a time for the watchmen to mount the walls and sound a clear, unmistakable warning message of the dangers facing not just the English-speaking peoples, but also the whole world. It is a time to make known the hope of the coming kingdom of God. Isaiah's message stands bright and clear today. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Your watchmen shall lift up their voices. With their voices they shall sing together, for they shall see eye to eye when the Lord brings back Zion. Isaiah 52, 7. Come, take your place on the walls. Work for the kingdom and pray for its speedy arrival. Do not return to your old ways or your old shame. 
and do not go the way of the crowd that is walking blindly, but remain and abide in his grace and show his love. Stay in the fire. Stay in his will, no matter how uncomfortable you are. Trust him. Do not turn to the left or the right, but remain on the narrow path. God bless you in your obedience. Get dressed and stay dressed. The king is coming. Romans 13, 14. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. We literally clothe ourselves in Christ. He is our spiritual clothing. Romans 13, 11. Wake from sleep. Cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. But when the king came in to view the guests, he looked intently at a man there who had on no wedding garment. And he said, friend, how did you come in here without putting on the appropriate wedding garment? And he was speechless, muzzled and gagged. Then the king said to the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him into the darkness outside. There will be weeping and grinding of teeth for many are called, invited and summoned, but few are chosen. Matthew 22, 11 through 14.